Thanks, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, joining. Thank you, Pete, for that intro, and apologies for the small glitch of the day. Hopefully, it's the last one we'll have. So, assuming everyone can see my screen, I'd like to welcome everyone to day three of Gamification Europe Conference 2020 edition. Uh, I hope everyone's been enjoying the conference so far. Uh, as you know, as Pete just said, today's theme is about managing and engaging communities. And with that, I would like to set the scene for today by having a look at how the psychology of gamification and game-based methodologies can help your community to thrive in not only this time of disruption, but also beyond it. Uh, so the outline for the virtual keynote today will be me giving a quick background of myself, and then I'll be taking you all through my thoughts and ideas of what to do to get a thriving community. And then at the end, hopefully there'll be some time left for Q&A. So first off, a little information on who I am and why I'm delivering this keynote today. As you may already know, my name is Albert Vandermeer. Uh, I originally come from a film production background, so producing short films, documentaries, and music videos. And this gave me the experience in and helped me to appreciate the intricacies of working in teams and understanding a wider audience and community. From there, I moved into corporate filmmaking and eventually into running activities that used film and TV production to facilitate team building, as well as doing some learning and instructional design. And I guess that's where sort of the gamification aspect came in. Through the team building activities and instructional design, I gained interest in gamification and started to understand how it worked. This led me to researching and co-authoring a book with Daniel Griffin, as I showed earlier, the, uh, which is called Press Start to use ga Using Gamification to Power Up Your Marketing. As you can see from the title, I'm also very excited and interested to see what the conference has to offer tomorrow. But to give you a quick idea of the book, it's about mainly focusing on helping people to quickly get into gamification and you know, use it with immediate applicability. Currently, I'm continuing my work in the field of gamification with a focus on the dynamics of how small to large groups of people interact with each other. And I guess this naturally leads me on to our topic of the day of how to engage communities. So with this varied list of experiences, I feel I've been fortunate enough to, have, to gain some knowledge in skills and skills in the field of gamification. And thus, I wanted to share some of that with you all today and hopefully leave you with a few takeaways that you can use in your daily lives and jobs. So with the state of the world as it is, and with a great many nations going back into lockdown or already in lockdown, and the use and benefits of communities is more important than ever. Having grown up in South Africa, there is a term I'd like to share with you all, and that references the importance of community. That term is Ubuntu. No, not the Linux uh, operating system, but the Zulu term. And it roughly translates to I am because we are, which means that a community is that which gives the individual meaning. An outcome of the pandemic has been that some of us have become isolated and our need and interest in finding and having a connection has increased. Many individuals and organizations and businesses have taken greater interest in building and growing and maintaining communities, not only for revenue and marketing purposes, but also for health reasons. We as humans do not do well in a vacuum. As we've no doubt all experienced now with working from home for several months, it is that network that we have and the community that forms from it that is very important. And businesses want and should capitalize on this fundamental need. But building and maintaining a community isn't easy. And anyone that says it is likely hasn't tried it. Thankfully, though, the psychology and the mechanics and game mechanics and elements that aid and support in building and maintaining a community are the same as those that we use in gamification every day. One of the many aims of good gamification is to leverage the motivator of belonging and to, at times, build a community for your players where they can socialize, communicate, share, and learn from each other to help promote themselves and the community as a whole. But to support you with my overall story today on how to help your community to thrive through the use of gamification and other such methodologies, I thought using a metaphor would probably be the best way to go about this. So if you've read the intro summary for this talk, then you'll have seen that it states that community can be likened to either a virus or a plant. Naturally, these are both very topical metaphors, what with the pandemic and climate issues being very real issues in our lives. 
So therefore, I'd like to take you through how these metaphors will help us understand the varying types of setups for how to build a community and the commonly held belief of how a community should work. But first, I'm going to take you through something a little different, a film analogy. And this will help us understand what businesses usually do. For a great many companies and organizations, there's a commonly held belief around how setting up a community should work. And that belief is what I like to call the field of dreams problem. If you haven't seen these, uh, this 80s film with Kevin Costner, the non-spoiler version is that it's about a man who hears a voice that tells him to build a baseball diamond so that a baseball legend can play one last time. Yep, and you guys, you guess it right. The phrase that Kevin Costner's character hears is, if you build it, they will come. It's that phrase that so many businesses believe is true when they build anything that has to do with communities. They truly believe that all they need to do is build the platform for people and then they will suddenly come and a community will co magically coalesce and maintain itself. The harsh reality is, is that this rarely works. And if it does, it's merely for a very short amount of time. Usually this type of process takes the shape of an organization gathering a few people who do the initial work to get a community started, then invite a group of other people that constitute that community and then leave it alone and hope for the best. What we've created in this scenario then is a community that acts more like a virus than a plant. The reason I liken this scenario to a virus is that the life cycle of the community follows that of a virus. A virus enters the body, consumes the resources without returning anything to the host, and once the host is exhausted, the virus either leaves or dies off with the host. And that's the end. Game over. These communities are essentially given a small amount of content at the start that some poor soul usually is tasked by upper management to create. And then the overarching belief takes hold that a little bit of content within the community will continue and then people will build upon it themselves. And so often that isn't the case. The community generally consumes that little bit, discusses it, and without anything new being added, the community either leaves or eventually dies out, just like with the virus and the host body. What I believe we need to do then is to move away from this and towards seeing, looking at a community as if it were a plant, an organic living thing that requires attention, nourishment, and eventually with time will bear its fruits and be able to say, sustain itself to an extent. And so, like with a plant, you need a gardener, or in our case, champion or champions, whose sole job is to keep the community going and get it past its initial sprouting stage and become a near self-sustaining plant. These champions will then take on the work of setting up what is essentially the basic tenet of any gamification enterprise, and that is setting objectives for the community in this case, researching and understanding the audience that will become the community, creating a journey outline for that audience, and considering what engagement mechanics best suit that audience. Going through all of that, you as a champion gardener will become the invisible hand that guides and nurtures the community, promoting interactions through regular content injection and promoting knowledge sharing. But the question is, how do we get from a community as a seedling to the fully matured plant that could survive on its own? It will take time and effort, and what you need to do is to look into what I believe are the five aspects of community building and maintenance. With these five aspects, I've also added the six motivational levers that my co-author and I discuss in our book. So first we have a common purpose, then we have a communal identity, communal accountability and responsibility, communal or shared activities, and lastly, communal safety. <clears throat> Each of these five aspects needs to be present in some form or another. Some can be there in greater amounts than others, but you do need all five of them. Think of them as the soil, the fertilizer, the sun, and the water for your community to take root and grow. And as with a plant, taking care of it with these five aspects needs to become routine. And the task of nurturing the community needs to be slowly shared with everyone that's part of that community. So therefore, I'd like to take you all through these five aspects and break them down individually into what they mean and what you should do, or at least think about when working with your own communities. The first aspect is common purpose. Naturally, it's links to the lever of purpose. To survive, every community needs a bonding agent, something around which the individual members can gather and coalesce, a solidifying a factor 
like a shared belief or a goal or a grand purpose. And we can see this in so many successful communities. A few quick examples of that are any religion or a political ideology. Online, it's with things like Wikipedia or games like League of Legends and World of Warcraft, who all have this grand purpose that you go for. The common purpose that is provided to these, to the members of the community, is what unites them and allows them to become that community, to form. But for the com common purpose to be to have any effect, it needs four features, I think. And these are meaning, value, agency, and urgency. Unfortunately, like with the others, this isn't a pick and mix, op mix option again. You do need all four of these aspects to be present in some measure when developing your common purpose. If people in your community can find meaning and value in what is being provided to them and what they can provide and contribute back, as well as having a sense of agency and urgency in participating in that community, then you'll have a strong basis of a loyal members who share that great grand common purpose. The best kind of common purpose is one that is aimed into the far future, I think. It may be obvious, but you need to be sure it's something that can hold over the long term. Too often, organizations inadvertently select a purpose that turns out to have no clear endpoint or is too short. The common purpose should be a concept that can evolve with the community. Common purpose that can be realized within a year or less just won't have the gravitational weight that allows a community to coalesce or sustain itself. At times, though, a long-term common purpose can be something ethereal, like a common interest, for example, with a Facebook group about making pasta or a gamification Facebook group. The community as an entity will continue on for a long time, but its individual members and user base will likely change as people's interests wane and increase and so forth. One of the best game mechanics to ensure that this common purpose is understood and that it can evolve and carry on is using narrative. Weaving a story or having story-like elements for your members will keep them connected and engaged. And the last point I just want to say with the common purpose is that it needs to align with the self-interests and goals of the members who join the community. Unfortunately, you can't control this completely, at least not without individually vetting every member that joins the community. But a way to guide this is by being transparent and authentic from the outset of what the community is about and what it can offer its members who voluntarily join to choose and collaborate and be active within the community. This will ensure that everyone is clear on what they are joining and have made an informed choice about joining the community and achieving that common purpose. Excuse me. The second aspect then is a communal identity. This links to the motivational driver of belonging. Communities like individuals will after a while develop their own identities. <clears throat> These identities will slowly become some distinct entities who can separate themselves from the larger collective entity of, uh, of society. One feature that you'll probably notice when a community starts developing its own identity is the fact that it will either create, develop, or appropriate its own so-called semiotic domain. You'll probably have come across this term if you've read anything by the American educator, James Paul G. A semiotic domain, then, is a conceptual area where members of a group share a common language, traditions, symbols, and stories. And when I talk about language, I don't mean they're actually constructing their own language. It's rather they're using specific jargon and terminology. In essence, they've created their own shorthand or slang. A great example of this is actually our own gamification community. We all discuss things in terms of mechanics and elements and motivational drivers and so on. But anyone outside of that community will likely not understand what we're talking about, at least not at first. These new members will need to learn the vocabulary in order to fit in. One of the outcomes of having a unique culture like that is that the community will inevitably become exclusive. Community will evolve and become selective of what members it wants and doesn't want as it wants some people with similar interests and shared purposes. This can be both an advantage and a disadvantage, of course. The disadvantage is that the exclusiveness can lead to an isolation and distancing. The advantage, on the other hand, is that members feel a sense of pride when they join this exclusive community. The next part of that sort of evolution of a communal identity is that the members start to develop their own unique identities within that community again. Various individuals who are invested in it will want to take on new roles. 
Sometimes this may require the guiding hand again of where you select a few champions for this. The gamification aspect of that where you can sign titles and levels for these cha champions and how they're in the community with terms like, you know, beginner and veteran and expert and master and so on. The thing is though, for these roles to even be a possibility, a community needs to remain healthy and active. And one way for them to remain healthy and active is by recruiting new members at a consistent rate. I don't mean new members need to come in every day or every week, but you need to sort of ensure that new blood gets regularly put in. And as I mentioned before with the semiotic domain, it also includes traditions and rituals and having members coming in at a regular rate and being of all different levels of experience in a community, being celebrated through these rituals and traditions is a method of keeping the overall identity alive, regardless of how often the new blood is added. In essence, the celebration of the achievements and creates and facilitates a bond through shared experience and shared memories. All of this then feeds back into that sense of belonging foot within the community. It helps people to acknowledge that the time and effort that they put into the community is actually worth it. So the third aspect then is communal accountability and responsibility. And here we're dealing with the motivational levers of autonomy and esteem. Best way to think about this is that with great identity comes great responsibility. What I mean by this is that for a community to survive for over the long term, all of its members need to be made aware of the fact that they all shoulder a level of responsibility. Every member is accountable for, co for the collective well-being of that community and each other in it. An example parable of this is with the more ancient communities where we were hunter-gatherers. Communities like that would only survive if everyone in the community contributed to it. If you only lived off the community and never contributed to it, then you would be eventually ousted as a leech because you're not a worthwhile member of the tribe. Though the sense of awareness becomes much more difficult when communities start growing beyond a certain size. Uh, this relates back to, the, to Dunbar's number of 150 people within a community, if you've heard of it. Once you move beyond that number, it becomes much more difficult to maintain the accountability and balance of a community. As the guiding hand then, you may be required or your champions may be required to separate the community into smaller groups for it to contribute and to continue being relevant to maintain a better overview. But for this to happen, you do need some kind of governing superstructure that exists inside each group and for the overall segmented community. All of this links back into the communal identity again, since if everyone has a connection with each other in the form of a collective identity, then they will understand the need to shoulder the responsibility of maintaining the community. You can then select or use your champions again, who can then become the leaders of those individual groups who then connect with the overall leaders of the entire community. And if you're thinking this sounds familiar, then you are right. Because many military structures in the world work in the same way. They have various levels of responsibility, which reduces the number of people you move as you move towards the top of the pyramid. In the end, you have one general at the top and then colonels and majors and lieutenants and so forth below them. I like the example of military for this because it effectively shows the need and benefit of a shared sense of accountability and responsibility. Because when every member has that within the superstructure, there will eventually community will become a self-structured and self-regulating entity. But for all of that to be possible, you need your community to do something that fosters that identity and accountability. And as I mentioned before, this takes the shape of shared activities. And that's the fourth aspect of our community. Having a communal or shared activities links to the motivator of mastery. People become members of a community when they find meaning in doing activities together. The reason mastery links to this is because shared activities tend to take the form of knowledge creation and knowledge sharing. And then other members in the community start mastering that knowledge and then repeat the process by creating new content. The basis for this idea is that people are communal creatures to some varying degree, obviously. Uh, we like sharing stuff and by sharing and understanding and learning and creating, we create a new bond and a relationship. With the activity of members consuming and creating content they can master, this then builds upon the previous aspects, the strengthening of identity, the fostering of purpose, and so forth. When this happens, the community will evolve from having a secondary objective of re simply remaining together for knowledge transfer 
to one that now seeks to protect its overall semiotic domain, you know, the language, the traditions, the rituals. The negative version of this exclusivity, as I mentioned before, is this sort of us versus them mentality. But with a guiding hand, you or your champions can move the community to a positive state of content creation, a mindset of learning from each other and maintaining the intrinsic value and meaning of that knowledge sharing. This learning stage is essential as it promotes the mastery and curiosity both within its current member base, but also promotes that community itself for future members in the larger society of any members who want to maybe join that community. From this, we then can link back into sort of peer recognition and the acknowledgement within the community again. So as you can slowly see, as we're coming to the fourth aspect, you're getting closer to creating a feedback loop where a community is almost a self-sustaining entity. As the community injects value into itself, it starts to reap the benefits from that. And quite a few members will then want to contribute as well, injecting new value yet again. A good example of this is the free to play or free to participate platforms in a lot of games and online platforms. The quality of the content that's so often so provided within that is of such a high level that people are attracted to it and value it. And the way they let you know how, they, how much they value it is by either contributing a monetary value or by contributing intellectually, by adding content of their own and value on top of what is already there. As long as you, as the guiding hand, offer a space where members of the community can discuss the content, then the organic growth of that collective can be nurtured. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this brings us to our final aspect, which is communal safety. And as you can guess, it links to the motivator of safety. The final aspect is fairly straightforward and quite short, I think. For any community to survive and thrive, much like a plant, the environment must be secure. The initial seeding stage where you create the space for a community must be a safe place. And then the community itself must reflect that safety back to its members. If at any point it feels threatened or insecure, then it will fail. Much like placing a plant in an inhospitable environment, the community must be welcoming, show that it is a safe space and its members must take pride in that safety. And there are three important tenets for being able to provide the safety, I think, and they are security, respect, and privacy. And this is where you as the guiding hand will have a lot of work to do initially. I feel that these three tenants should be fairly obvious as requirements for a successful and thriving community. And often they take the shape of things of being like doing moderation or checking on guidelines and so forth and similar responsibilities. The one thing I'd like to make clear around safety is that it isn't necessarily something that you can or should gamify, I guess. I know that I'm sure there are many effective gamification methods and others may have them as well. But I think from the perspective of maintaining community, it's an aspect that needs to be done in a very direct manner. Members of any community place a great deal of safe value on safety. The fact that there is safety in a community, I think, is an aspect of good gamification rather than gamification itself. So there you have it. The five aspects of what I believe is what a community needs to thrive. Shared goals, shared investment, and a shared effort improves the chances of a community surviving. And as long as you keep the community ethos transparent and authentic around its objectives and the expectations of the members, then people will always have a sense of inclusion. And at the end of the day, you as the guiding hand need to help people to be able to enter that community easily, discover what it is about, and learn from it and then be able to inject back into it and that everybody in the community is doing this in equal amounts. Then through this and by implementing some game mechanics that help to strengthen these behaviors, you and everyone in the community can have a strong and healthy plant that bears fruit for everyone to enjoy. And to discover what kind of game mechanics you can use, I know that my colleagues following me today will give you all an in-depth look on what is effective and what isn't. So, thank you very much for listening to me today, and I hope that everyone enjoys the rest of today's theme and the overall conference. Looking at the time, I actually do have some time for questions and answers, if people have any. Uh, otherwise, Pete's there. What a fantastic, fantastic presentation, Albert.
That's exactly what I wanted. So you delivered. Thank you very great. much. <laughs> and I can tell everyone's interested from the chat, but also we've got quite a few questions. So uh, luckily cool. people have been voting on them because we won't have time to ask them all. Uh, Brilliant. For the first one, okay. How long mm -hmm. do you think this process of creating a community takes on average? Well, that is a difficult question to answer. It's the same as asking how long is a piece of string. <laughs> it's It can take any number of time or length, how long it needs to be. I think it's uh, the way it is the same. It's the use of the analogy with the plant again. It's however long it takes, it's going to take that long. And you just simply need to be diligent in making sure that you're nurturing it and keeping it going. Okay. You kind of got away from that. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Next one from Jesse Weird. Um, what aspect is the hardest to create? Um, I'd say in terms of creating yourself, making sure that the common purpose is one that everybody connects to is probably the hardest. The other side of it, the one that you can't really create is the communal identity. That's something you need to help to foster and go. So it's probably those two. Creating shared activities and the safety and those sort of things are fairly easy and straightforward. But I'd say the first two that I mentioned in terms of the purpose and belonging motivational levers, those are the hardest. I would agree with that as well. <clears throat> okay, cool. Um, if you've never managed a community, this question is from Lena, do you have an example on how to get started and see the actual effects of these motivational levers? Yeah, if you've never managed a community, then I'd probably recommend in terms of like, you know, come back to the gaming aspect. Uh, if you want to start, say, for a done a Dungeons and Dragons group, you know, have a little community like that or enter any, you know, massive multiplayer online game like World of Warcraft or EVE Online. Join one of those and then you can instantly get a very refined experience of what a community is like and how the structures work and all of that. You're doing great at answering these, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, the next question, and I like the fact people are voting on these as well. So it's making my life easy choosing which one. <laughs> this one's from Tamir over in Mongolia. How do you incentivize champions? Uh, incentivizing them is well difficult in the initial stages. You sort of have to find the ones that are interested enough, and once they're there, you start using some of those gamification mechanics of you know giving them status and positions and all of that and actually making it clear that they are the champions so that they remain in that position for longer so actually lifting them above everyone else i think those those are the main things and that it's, everybody recognizes it which sort of comes back to that sort of uh you know celebrating achievements and rituals and traditions that i was talking about that's fantastic oh, i think we've got time for one more all right um well there's one being voted up as i speak <laughs> so i'm going to choose that one this one's from abilash pura hint who did a great talk on Monday, by the way. Mm, yeah, I saw that. It was very good. And he asks, how to handle a situation when previously active members lose steam and stop contributing altogether? Which, obviously, what a great question. It is a great question. And it's it's a very difficult one to answer because it's when people start losing interest, it's it's usually symptomatic of the fact that there isn't content for them that is being, that they, they find interesting themselves. So is why I say that you need to continue being a guiding hand rather than letting things go its own course. So you then need to come back in again and inject new content, make sure that they're still engaged and probably speak to them personally. So then again, having like one-to-ones with them asking like, why are you losing interest? I saw that you were doing this before, why not now? And then learning from that and then building upon that again within your community. Thank you very much, Albert. I can tell from the chat as well, there's a loads of positive feedback on your talk also my partner's in the room she was listening to your talk she stole <laughs> my copy of your book <laughs> she wants to read it fair enough okay. <laughs> so that's cool so albert will be around for the rest of the day i'm sure yep. to answer any questions Definitely. so he'll join in the chat i'm sure okay really thank you very much albert thank you thank you pete thank you everyone